fourth and final lecture by Professor Berkowitz. Okay, so this is my last lecture, and I won't be here for the discussion session. So this is the last chance to ask questions. So um, I'll start by reviewing the things I said before, and maybe that will give a chance for some people to ask questions. But before I forget, um, in May there'll be a more advanced school on, uh, on various topics, but topological strings and string field theory, and also this double field theory that Bart mentioned in the colloquium. So people that are interested, the application form is not yet up, but maybe in one or two months it should be online. Okay, so um, in the first lecture, In the second lecture, I discuss world line and world sheet. The third lecture was mostly brand new. This lecture will be mostly about supergravity. about spins in different dimensions. The structure of gamma matrices, the dimensions of the representation. OK, then in the second lecture, um, well, I also discussed the general supersymmetry algebra and the implications. So the energy is always greater than or equal to 0, and if you have equal number of bosons and fermions in each mass number. Yes. Um, so could you explain a bit more detail? Uh, what is the, when you computed this trace of minus yes. 1 to the f, what is the definition of this minus 1 to the f? Okay. So minus 1 to the f, it just means that if it's a fermion, it's minus 1. If it's a boson, it's plus 1. Mm -hmm. So if you put this into the trace, many operator here. What it means is that normally a trace is over all states. So what this means is it's a sum over all the bosonic states with just the operator here, minus the sum over all fermionic states of that operator. But one can't commute this minus one to the f with this operator? Right. So this operator has to be bosonic, otherwise this trace is zero. So minus one to the f commutes with the with the operator. But Suppose the operator is a product of two Qs. So in our case, the operator would have to be Q1 with Q1. So in this case, minus 1 to the F, Q1, is equal minus Q1. And the reason is because if you have a bosonic operator, and you hit it with a fermionic operator, then it's going to change sign. Um, okay. Um, minus one to the f on a bosonic operator, on a bosonic state, is just the state itself. The state is bosonic. Minus one to the f on a fermionic state is finally minus. So now suppose we look at this object. So minus the f on q1. Well, let's say that's on a bosonic state. All right, all right, all right. It turns into a fermion. So this is equal to minus the f on a fermionic state, which is equal to minus. Whereas if I did q1 minus f in a bosonic state, now you don't get the minus sign, so it's just q1 of the bosonic state, which is just f without the minus. So the difference between these would be the minus. And that was crucial for proving that you have an equal number of bosons and fermions at every mass. Level. the second lecture. So this was a course used by Carmen. And I don't 
there were many aspects that I discussed here that were used by Kant. For example, the, the X's in, in the action of the spinning string have a left moving and a right moving component, whereas the fermions, the psi's, just have either a left or, or a right. So that's why, although naively it looks like you have twice as many fermions as bosons, it turns out you have an equal number of left moving bosons and left moving fermions, and an equal number of right moving bosons and right moving fermions. Do okay, have any questions about this? Because this will be obviously important for Kahneman. <coughs> Okay, then in the third lecture I discussed super-Yang-Mills and I started by discussing the dimension of the representation of supersymmetry in any dimension, but it depends on the, how, how, how many Qs you have. So if you have Q if alpha, for alpha equals 1 to R, I discussed the different cases. So if R over 4 was odd, This splits up into two cases, where r over 8 is odd, and r over 8 is even. Now these cases are somewhat special in the sense, in all the other cases you have 2 to the, let's see, so in four dimensions, um, r is equal to 4, so r over 4 is odd. And we know we have four states. We have two bosons and two fermions. So this lets choose two masses. I also did masses, but it's more important. So when r is four, this is odd. And we know we have four states. So this is a two to the r over four plus one. In this case also, you're going to get two to the r over four plus one states. Remember, here you've got the <coughs> The extra one because the state had to be complex. <coughs> complex conjugate had the opposite statistics. Here it had to be, you got the extra one because it was pseudo real. There was no way to define it to be the complex conjugate itself. Only in this case do you get 2 to the hour of a 4. So the first time this occurs is in 10 dimensions where you have. Um, r is equal to 16, so 16 over 8 is even, it's 2. So you get 2 to the 16 over 4 states, which is 16. You have 8 bosons and 8 fermions. So that was the case of 10 dimensional superangle. And that is where I'll start today, because I, I did it quickly yesterday, but it was a little bit slow. has 16 supersymmetries. R is 16. In this case, the action called capital M and capital M is reserved small m for a tournament. If you're doing non billion you have a trace here. And I'm not being careful with coefficients, so I don't have to look at my notes. And then you have a term here which is sigma. obviously has to be a symmetric matrix because it's symmetric if you exchange alpha and beta. And these sigma matrices, the Pauli matrices, satisfy properties. Well, obviously,
plus the commutator. And so if we want space-time supersymmetry, because the blue one is always in the adjoint representation, the gluino, this psi, has to also be in the adjoint representation. So this is where Ti are the generators of the blue. Now in 10 dimensions, the blue one has eight physical components. It's always D minus two. And the fermion, although alpha has 16 components, only eight are on shell. So it has eight bosons and eight fermions. And the supersymmetry transformations are relatively straightforward. Any other questions about me? Okay, so the next thing I did quickly at the end of the last lecture was discuss dimensional reduction to four dimensions. So we assume, so this is of course going to be relevant for the open stream when we do, um, when Carmen does um, the spinning string in ten dimensions. Now if you dimensionally reduce to four dimensions, without breaking any supersymmetry, so we just compactify on a six torus, you still have 16 supersymmetries, you haven't broken them. But now it's called n equals 4, n equals 4 super eight mils, because we have 4 times as many as the minimal amount. So the minimal amount is 4. Remember, yesterday I also discussed d equals 4, n equals 1 super eight. So in this case, what will happen is, these fields here will split up into four dimensional fields. So AM. So we assume that all the fields are independent of X, except for the first four. So it's independent of X4 to X9. And we split the vector to a four dimensional vector. Now m is equal to 0 to 3. Alpha and alpha dot will now just be 1 or 2. So it will split into a 4 and a 6. I'll call 6, 5, just because it's a, these are scalars. Okay? They don't carry any Lorentz indices with respect to the 4 dimension. So j equals 1 to Now the spinners will also decompose. Sorry, I call this capital A in spinner notation. So 
alpha and alpha dark go from 1 to 2, but A and B go from 1 to 16. So we're going to split this 16 component object into four component, well, really two component objects, these alpha and alpha dot. But of course, you still have 16 of them. So what happens is, when you break SO91 by doing the compactification, it splits up into SO31 times SO6. SO6 is the same as SU4. The spinners have four components, but they're complex. So this psi D is going to split up into a spinner which has an SO31 spinner index, but it also has an SO6 index. <coughs> and it's complex, so you also have A bar. So these are the 16 size because A, A bar go from 1 to 4. SO6 has four dimensional spinner representation. They're just the fundamental and anti fundamental of SU4. Okay, any questions up to now? Uh, is there any way to see that SO6 is SU4? Yes. Um, so Let's define SU4. So SU4 So SU4 are the transformations that preserve uh, really that preserve this and you also Let's, if I did SO3 and SU2, it would work that way. It should work the same. Oh, it's SO3 U4. Sorry, I said SU4. No, it's SU4. SU4. No, it's SU4. SO6 has 15 generators. Yeah. SU4 has 15 generators, so it's SU4. Um, so, okay. I'll answer this by the end of the class. Okay. Any other questions? It says 16 real components. Real components. Yes. These size are Majorana vial, so they are real. Remember, in, in 10 dimensions, in 10 dimensions, oh, that was a question I ran out to. In 10 dimensions, uh, the, the spinner has two to the four real components. Does it answer the question? Is there another question? turn the arrow in the other direction, but it's not going to be true. Any action written in terms of size I can write in terms of the unit will be covariant with respect to SO31 times SO6. But the converse is not true. If I write an action which is covariant with respect to SO31 times SO6, it's not always covariant with respect to SO91. So the error really is only one direction. Is there any particular assumption when we choose uh, the compact manifold to be the torus, the sixth torus? Yes, so we chose the compactification so that it didn't break any supersymmetries. It, and that's the only topology that does that? Or perhaps if I do it in the sixth sphere or something like that? Sixth sphere will break supersymmetry. Okay. There are some compactifications you can do which don't break all the supersymmetries. So George may talk about this the end of the week. If you compactify on something called Calabia, you start with 16 and you break it down to 4. So only 4 are preserved. Yeah. 
But um, if you want to preserve all 16, the only thing you can do is, is on torus. I assume also that uh, we are compactifying six dimensions because we, have to, we want to have a realistic theory in four dimensions. You could compactify more. So this is just yeah, just abstract the, theory. Yeah. But the reason why I did to four dimensions is because that's going to become relevant in the talks by um, next week, what ADS CFT, this n equals 4, d equals 4. So if you compactify it to d equals 3, it would be n equals 8. If you compactify it to d equals 2, it would be n equals 16. We'll stop here. This n equals four, but it's not the number of generators. No, it's the product. So, if it was n equals one, it would mean you had four generators. So it's n times the minimum number. N is the number of times n. N equals one means four. It's the number of. It's the multiples of the minimum number. No, this is smaller. So I've broken some symmetries. So from the group theoretical point of view, what do you mean by breaking up? This, this is a subgroup of this. So when you compactify, you break some of the symmetries, but not all. You preserve a subgroup. And this is a subgroup that is preserved. For example, the rotations is a subgroup of the Lorentz algebra. Yeah. So n equals 4 is the number of minimal numbers you can have in n equals 4 domains. Yes. So now we, we, we have more than uh, n equals 4. No. Let, me, let me write it in words, because I don't think it's getting through. So n equals 1 yeah. means you have D equals 4 means you have 4 supersymmetry, which is the minimal number. N equals 4, D equals 4, means you have 4 times 4 supersymmetry. In other words, you have 4 times the minimal number. So that's what this N means. It's the number of this minimal number in four dimensions is four. On the other hand, this is called n equals one, d equals ten. Because it's one times the minimal amount in ten dimensions. The minimal in ten dimensions is sixteen. So this is the language, but it's universal, so you have to learn. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I will say something about it in five minutes, but at the moment, let's suppose it doesn't depend. If it does depend, then you start getting. Oh, I didn't write down the action. So the action you get by compactifying is a four-dimensional action. <coughs> four times the volume of the compactification. You get many terms. It's trace of FMN, FMN, that's obvious. You also get kinetic term for fermion in four dimensions. But this gets covariantized, of course, with respect now to four dimensions. So that comes just from naively just plugging this into here and this into here. But you also get some terms for five. So you also get the term like del m phi j, del m plus j. So this term comes from the field strength, when one of the indices of the field strength is small m, and the other index of the field strength is small j. So when the derivative is small j, it vanishes, because we decided that the fields are independent of xj. <coughs> On the other hand, if the k 
capital M index of capital A is J, you get the contribution, which is precisely this. Now, there are other terms you get from the interaction. So, for example, this has terms which are also quadratic in A, which can generate terms which are quadratic in phi. So you'll get further terms of this type. And you also get couplings of the phi's with the psi's through this term, because this covariant derivative could have a phi in it instead of an a. So you also get terms. These terms couple two fermions with the phi. Okay, so this is the action for n equals 4, d equals 4 sub n. And the easiest way to derive it is by starting in 10 dimensions and just doing exactly this reduction. Of course, you could start in 4 dimensions and try to construct this to be super symmetric, and you'd find that you would have to have all these terms. But it's obviously easier if you start with this expression, which you can write in just two terms. This scalar from the spine, they, they are scalars in the ratio 3, 1. Yes. Are they vectors in the, the SO6? Yes. semi-direct product means. I think it's just the direct product. It's just it's SO3-1 times SO6. So, so direct product means that the two generators commute? All of these generators commute with all of yeah, these. So That's called direct product? Yes. That's direct product. Okay. So it's clear that these generators commute. So if you start with the Lorentz generators here, that's M, capital M, capital N. Those are the generators of SO91. The generators here are either M small m, small n, or M small j, small k. So there's no indices in common for the answer. Any other questions? Sorry. You have psi at k and psi bar k bar in the second term. In the second term, you have psi alpha a and psi bar. Yes, that's correct. A bar, but you don't contract A and A bar. Yeah, when I write A, A, sorry, my notation is, so A, this is the fundamental representation of SU4. This is the anti-fundamental. So there's no delta A, B. There's no way to um, contract an A with a B. The only thing you can contract is an A with an A bar. So. This object makes sense. So uh, SU4, or any of the SUN, um, you can contract the fundamental and anti-fundamental. You can't contract the fundamental and fundamental. You should have them over there. Yeah, OK. Sorry, does that make sense? I didn't tell you what this sigma j a b is. So these are Klepto-Gordon coefficients. Or you can think of them as Pauli matrices of SO6. Either way. So SO6, remember, has four dimension, four component spinner representations. And these are precisely the, the Pauli matrices that you use to construct the gamma matrices for SO6. These are the chiral, these are the anti. So this is exactly the, the theory that we need to make this. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Well, that's the action where there is independence of the four. It's four is five, six, six. 
That's right. It only depends on, it's a four-dimensional action. It's not a ten-dimensional action. <coughs> okay, now there's a question. Suppose you have dependence on other field, on other axes. So what kind of dependence you can have? So if it's if I'm rectifying on a torus, so let's just do one circle. So let's say this is the x4 direction. So this means x4 is identified with x4 plus 2 pi r, where 2 pi r is the radius of the circle that you compactify. What that means is that the momenta in this direction has to be discrete. It can't take arbitrary values. So p in this fourth direction has to be equal to n over r, where n is mutant. Okay, so this is something uh, that you learn when you discuss code line compactification because you want e to the i x4 d4 to be single value. So when x4 goes to x4 plus 2 pi r, this is only single value if p4 has value n over r. Now if n equals 0, then of course there's no dependence on x4. So that's the case we were discussing here. But you can discuss the case when, for example, this small n is non-zero. So how does that change? change? So what it does is, uh, maybe I'll go here. So if all the n's are zero, so this would be in four, of course I could have n in any of the directions. Then the algebra, what you find is you have q. So of course, the original algebra is this. We're in 10 dimensions. This was qa, qb, capital M, capital A. What happens when we do dimensional reduction? What happens to this algebra? Well, if all the p's are 0 except in the first four directions, then the algebra reduces to q alpha a. Q alpha dot A bar is equal to delta A A bar sigma M alpha alpha dot P M. Those are the only elements of this which are non-zero. So that's just because all the other P's are zero. So the only polymatrix that enters is the four polymatrices here. Now suppose we turn on some of these p's. What will happen is you'll generate new elements in the algebra. So for example, you'll find that q alpha a with q beta b e is no longer 0. So before, these were the only ones which were non-zero. If you turn on p4, what you get is you get a term here, which is sigma 4 a b more generally, you get sigma j, a, b, b, j. Now, if, because we're considering compactification on a circle, these p's can only be integer values. So this is equal to sigma j, a, b, n over r, and j over r. You have six circles. These objects here, in four dimensions, look funny. Because normally, if you're doing four-dimensional supersymmetric field theories, these Q's, the chiral Q's, they anti-commute. Okay, the only ones that don't anti-commute are chiral and anti-chiral. But when you turn on these P's in the internal directions, the supersymmetry algebra changes. And these objects here are called central charges. So from the four-dimensional point of view, these objects look like some kind of, because it's n has to be an integer, you can understand that it's something topological. It's not something, these p's can be whatever you want. But these have to be integers, so you can, you can understand why they're topological objects. If you deform the system, they're not going to change. But you can't change them continuously. 
Okay, so this is something that is extensively studied, but I, I won't have time to say more than just define. Okay, so that's one thing that can happen if you include dependence on these extra directions that the supersymmetry algebra will change and you'll start to get these central charges. You have the same number of Qs. You don't change the space-time supersymmetry algebra. You start to have massive states because these states, P4 is non-zero, then of course the mass in four dimensions is changed. So you start to have massive states, but the supersymmetry, no, you still preserve the supersymmetry. You have equal number of bosons in front. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so now we're going to go to supergravity. So, J is 1 to 6, well, it's 5 to 9. Indices which are not these. It's not uh, uh, four to nine. Okay. Ah, thank you. Somebody's awake. <laughs> Epsilon alpha beta. Yeah. So the central charge. And the negation of the central charge. Ah, here also. So it has to be, this is of course symmetric if you exchange both alpha A and beta B. These matrices here turn out to be anti-symmetric if you exchange A and B, so it has to be also anti-symmetric if you exchange alpha B. So the, the charge that is the physical consequence of the of having this central charge is the mass? The That's right. These, these central charges are related to the masses. When you have a supersymmetric, so these are sometimes called Q, well, let's call it Q small, just so it's not confused with capital Q. It's like a charge. Mm -hmm. And when the theory is supersymmetric, the mass squared has to be equal to Q squared. And that's clear because the mass squared is just going to come from P4 squared. So they are related to the mass. Mm -hmm. Uh, the study that the topology is different when we treat them as a supermanifold? Or well, is the same definition of topology? Supermanifold has, uh, I'm saying in my words, and maybe somebody will object, but there's no difference in the topology of a supermanifold and an ordinary manifold. Super has no topology. So, this is just a torus. You can put as many fermions on you as you want, it's still a torus. What did you say about the mean? I thought you said they were symmetric. Yeah, were you're right. So, um, these 10 dimensional ones are symmetric. They have to be because this is symmetric here. When you do in six dimensions, so this is SO6, remember. In SO6, You have the A and B indices. Well, let me tell you what the space-time supersymmetry generator is on the six. Remember, in six dimensions, this is pseudo-real. So you have to have an extra index. So one and two, for example. This one is equal to sigma j AB j. Now, this is not necessarily symmetric because you see one of these is one and one of them is two. So in ten dimensions it had to be symmetric because the representation was real. In six dimensions it doesn't have to be because it's pseudo-real. In fact you can make it even clearer if you replace this by i and j and it turns out of course i and j is one or two. You have an I epsilon ij here. So now it's clear, it actually has to be anti-symmetric. So the symmetry or anti-symmetry properties of the polymatrices depends on the dimension. 
not always symmetric, but always empty. Another question? Yeah. Uh, okay, so now we'll do for gravity. Instead of starting directly in 10 dimensions, I want to say a little bit more about this n equals 4 equals 4 subpoenaing mills. So in this case, we have r equals 16. And remember, when we were constructing the, the representation, we had r over 4 minus signs. And this is what told me I had 2 to the 4 states. So the 16 states of superangles, the 8 bosons and 8 fermions, can be represented in terms of this plus and minus notation. And in fact, you can say something more in four dimensions. In four dimensions, you have this concept of helicity for massless states, or spin. And it turns out the spin is just going to be half times the number of minus plus signs. In other words, each plus sign So changing from a plus sign to a minus sign changes the spin by a half. The reason is because, remember, to change from a minus sign to a plus sign, you hit with Q. If you hit with a chiral Q, it raises the list. If you hit with an anti chiral Q, it lowers the list. So this is the formula for the spin. So for example, plus, 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 that has spin 2, has uh, spin 1, because you have 4 plus signs. Minus, 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 that has spin minus. Plus, plus, minus, minus, that has spin 0. And of course, the other ones, this has spin a half. More precisely, helicity, not spin. These objects are, of course, the fermion. These are the scalars. So it's easy to see there are six possible ways you can choose two pluses and two minus. So these are the six scalars. And these are the blue ones. Spin one and spin minus one. This city plus one and minus one. So using this language, we not only know how many bosons and how many fermions, we also know the spin, or the helicity. Spin is usually defined to be always positive, or helicity. So helicity is the spin contracted with the momentum. OK, so this is a concept in four dimensions. Okay, but Let's do the counting in four dimensions just to simplify. So this is n equals 4, which is why we have 16 10. Any questions? OK, now let's do n equals 8. So of course, we could do less than n equals 8. but just because the supergravity one we're interested in is n equals 8. So we have now 8 of these. So we have 32. And the first thing I will explain is why you will never have more than n equals 8 in 4 dimensions. So if you have 8, then obviously the one with all pluses is now spin 2. One with all minuses, spin minus. Now these are precisely the degrees of freedom of a graviton. And you can work out all the others. So for example, spin zero, you'll have four pluses and four minuses. And if 
you have three, uh, six pluses and two minuses, these are spin one. So you can easily count how many of these you have. You have 28 of these, one of these, one of these. I'm not going to try to count this one, but I think it's seven. So altogether, of course, you know you're going to have 256 states. Here you have 16 states. Here you have 256 states. And you can get, you can see this, the helicities of these states. Now suppose I had n bigger than 8. Well, let's do, for example, n equals 10. Then you're going to have one more minus plus and minus sign. And then instead of going from spin 2, it's going to be we have 10 of these. It's going to start with spin 5 halves. So you have a higher spin theory, higher than gravity. And you'll find that at spin 2, which if you have, whatever, 9 of these and 1 minus, or probably 8 of them and 2 minus, you'll get more than one spin 2. So you'll get many spin 2, depending on, uh, I'm not going to try to count, but you get more than one. So for n greater than 8, more than one gravity. So we don't know how to make sense out of those states. You will also have higher spin, spin higher than two. We don't know how to make sense out of theories with spin with massless particles of spin higher than two. Now it's not saying that nobody will ever make sense out of them, but at the moment we say that these theories don't make sense. So the maximum amount of supersymmetry in four dimensions is n equals 8. Or in other words, the maximum number of generators is 32. And now we can go backwards and say, well, what is the maximum dimension we can have in which we have at most 32 generators? Can you repeat that? Five that? Yeah. Well, because we just do the count things. So if you have more than eight plus signs, this is going to be bigger than 2. If you have 10 plus sign, then no minus sign, this will be 10 over 4, which is 5 over 2. OK, so this is the argument why people do not study supersymmetries bigger than 8 in 4 dimensions, bigger than n equals 8, or systems with more than 32 generators. But you can ask, what is the maximum dimension in which we have 32 or fewer generators? And the maximum dimension is 11. In 12 dimensions, you will see that the minimum representation of the spinners is 64. Okay, so this implies that the maximum where r equals less than or equal to 32 implies t equals 11. But t equals, in other words, R less than or equal to 32 implies D is less than or equal to 11. So that's why people don't cite supersymmetric theories in dimension bigger than 11. Well, most people. <laughs> okay, any questions? Okay, so now we're going to study this 11 dimensional theory. Now, of course, the string lives in 10 dimensions. But it turns out, as you'll learn next week, there's a version of a non-perturbative theory. There's a non-perturbative theory, which is related to string theory, which lives in a lab. Most people call it M theory. And the low energy limit of this M theory is 11-dimensional supergravity. So although 11-dimensional supergravity doesn't appear directly in string theory, it appears indirectly through this non perturbative version. OK, so one thing we know immediately is how many states we have. Because when r equals 32, we know we have 256 states, or so 128 bosons, 128. 
Furthermore, we know that the theory has gravity because when we dimensionally reduce to four dimensions, we have a spin two. The only way to get the spin two from dimensional reduction is if you have a spin two or higher in other dimensions. So this theory has gravity. So we can immediately ask, well, how many components, how many physical degrees of freedom does gravity have in 11 dimensions? So m equals 0 to 10. So I know two ways to compute this. One way is you, first you write down all the components of GMN. So obviously this is symmetric. So symmetric tensor has 10 times 11 divided by Sorry, 11 times 12. So that's 66. But it has age invariance. So this is, of course, reparameterization invariant. And it has 11 reparameterizations because we're given 11 dimensions. So you subtract 11. And furthermore, for each age invariant, you have an equation, you have an auxiliary field. So just like in four dimensions, the photon has one gauge symmetry and one auxiliary field, which reduces it by two. And similarly, gravity has an equal number of gauge symmetries and constraints, <coughs> equations or more, auxiliary equations. So that reduces it by another level. So you're left with 44. There's a quick way to get 44, which is to work in light cone gauge in which you start not with having all the polarizations, but just the polarizations in the transverse direction. And in that case, in light cone gauge, it's symmetric still, but it's traceless, because it's going to be, a, it has to be an irreducible representation. So you have, instead of 11 times 12 over 2, you have 9 times 10 over 2, minus the trace. So that's also good. OK, so this is the quick way. Now we need 128, so we're obviously missing something. The thing that we're missing is going to be a three form. So this is anti symmetric. So again, we can count by uh, all the components and then subtract the gauge invariances, but it's quick because to do it in light cone. So in light cone, instead of going from 0 to 10, you go from just 1 to 9, you just do the, the transverse direction, and it's anti-symmetric. So it's 9 times 8 times 7 over 6. And that should be equal to 3 times 4 times 7. I get 84. So that's good because 84 plus 44 is 1 times 8. Now, of course, we have the fermions. So the fermions, because we have spin 2 and we have supersymmetry, we know we need to have spin 3 halves. There was a question yesterday, how do you know if it's spin 3 halves or spin 5 halves? So in this dimension, it's easy to see because remember, the maximum one is the one with all 8 pluses. This was spin 2. There's no way to get spin 5 halves because you only have 8 of these. So the way to get the in three halves, if one of these is minus. So that gives you three halves and not five. Okay, so three halves is a gravitino, which you can think of as the direct product of a spin one and spin one half. So spin one, of course, has a vector index, and spin one half has a spinner index. So so gravitino has a, both a vector and a spinner index. And the physical degrees of freedom are obtained by, this has gauge symmetries. But if you take the light cone part of this, so instead of m going from 0 to 9, 10, you take just from 1 to 9. And multiply by the physical uh, components of a spinner, which is not 32. Alpha goes from 1 to 32. Because you have 32, r is 32. You only get half of them, because the usual thing. Spin one half, you have only 16, half of the 
components are on shelf. So the counting is 9 times 16, which doesn't work. You want 8 times 16. So, yeah, okay, I know, I know we're mistake. So in light cone gauge, if you take, this goes from 1 to 9, and this goes from 1 to 16, it turns out this representation is not irreducible. In the same way as this one, if you take it symmetric, you can subtract off the trace. This one is not irreducible, and you can subtract off, not the trace but the gamma matrix trace. So psi m alpha, if you contract it with sigma m alpha beta, you get a spinner. Right? This is just, let's call this chi beta. So that means this object here decomposes into an object which is spin one half and a spin three halves where it doesn't have, if you trace it with this you get zero. So that's why here you have to subtract off 16, just like here you subtract it off 1. So it's the spin 3 halves component of this. I don't know if, I, if I'm clear. If you take the direct product of, for example, spin 1 with spin 2, so Vm with Vn, you can get spin 2. Or you can get a scalar. You can get spin 0 or spin 2 if you take the direct product of two spin 1s. Similarly, if you take the direct product of spin 1 and spin 1 half, you can get two objects. You can get something which is spin 3 half, or you can also get spin 1 half. So that's why I have to subtract off the spin 1 half. Okay, this is group theory, but um, at least I want to say it correctly. Okay, any questions? Okay, so this is the this this is the, the physical content of supergravity. And and how do you get the free form? Do you see how it transforms under SO ten one or how so the problem is when I dimensionally reduce to four dimensions, this is going to decompose into all kinds of objects. Mm -hmm. So I um, I don't know how to get it. When the first people wrote down 11-dimensional supergravity, I mean, nobody believed, well, not believing was too strong, but it, they just had to do some complicated, comp so let me write down the action, and then you'll see why. Um, it's, not, it's not so straightforward to see why you get the three point. Um, so the Lagrangian, <coughs> So you have the usual Einstein-Hilbert term, separate from the metric, and you have a usual coupling of gravitino that Carmen mentioned yesterday in two dimensions. So this is the product of three polynomials. And you have a, a field strength coupled, coupled, constructed from from the gauge field, and then you have all these other terms. That, um, for example, you have a term of this type. not even manifest the gauge invariant. It is gauge invariant. It's a churn Simon slight term. And then you have couplings to the fermions. Couplings. So it's a complicated action. Um, nobody's been able to write it in super space. I, I, it's possible somebody knows the answer to your question, but I don't know the answer. What is it? Good. F M N is defined to be so this is a gauge field. It has a gauge transformation which is delta A M N P is equal to D M lambda N P anti symmetric. 
So it's a, if it had just one component, it would be like an ordinary gauge field. This, so it's an abelian gauge field. And the definition of the field strength is dm, d, and dq, all anti symmetries And the reason why you define it this way is because this is gauge invariant of the So in, this is called a four form field strength. So that's this. And of course, so the Vajin should be gauge invariant. But this term is not manifestly gauge invariant. So if you change A in this way, the Lagrangian will change, but it's easy to show it's a total derivative. So just like in terms of So this is a complicated Lagrangian. And the first people to found, find this, yes, E is what? Oh, I'm sorry, E is the beer bind. So in order to write down actions involving spinners, you need to introduce a tetrad formula. So you need to introduce a gear bind which um, relates flat space and coordinate space in this case. And I'm not going to have time to discuss this in detail, but um, it's necessary because um, so normally you just work with GMN. But it's possible to define tetrad in the following way. This is just the ordinary Minkowski tensor in 11 dimensions. So A and B also go from 0 to 10. But these are thought of as flat space indices. They're contracted, which is the ordinary Minkowski tensor. Whereas capital N and capital N are coordinate space indices that are contracted with using the metric. Okay, so this would take a few days to explain in detail, but it's, um, it's in any general relativity textbook where you talk about spinners. Because these are necessary in order to construct the Dirac action in a gravitational background. So the E is like the square root of minus T, right? That's right. But shouldn't that be a factor of all the so this E is actually determined to be. That's that's what the that's what small E means. Yeah, but shouldn't it be a factor of the rest of the terms, not of just the R? Ah, sorry. So determined to have E multiply everything? Uh -huh. um, oh, yes. Everything has to yes, 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 right. yes, you're right. We have written it here. Yes. Um, if I write it with epsilon mnpq, you see there's a determinant here. Epsilon, let me write it, a1 to a11 is equal to epsilon m1 to m11 times precisely this determinant. Because the definition of epsilon m1 to m11 So an epsilon tensor can only be defined using flat space indices. If you try to define using curved space indices, the way to define it is you find to be EM1, A1, EM11, A11, times epsilon, A1 to A11. This object here is precisely proportional to the determinant of E. This is equal to the determinant of E. saying it's in a clear way, but um, if you write, there's another way to write this term is if you replace these with with flat space indices and these with flat space indices, and then you don't need the, then you don't, don't need to determine it. Okay, I may, be, I, I may be confusing things. So uh, let me just say, I'm not sure if it's determined here, okay? Let me say it. It depends on the definition of what you're calling this epsilon. This was the most not a very precise uh, value in order to cross the uh, Yeah, the let me. I'm sorry? What? Is that the conversion of the Shosai in terms of the Shosai? Yeah, 
yes, they're all, they're all, so to, to be supersymmetric, all of these terms have to have precise coefficients. I didn't, I, I didn't try to write them down because I don't know them. So, so, so now I think I can answer your question. If this epsilon is just the usual epsilon, which is, if this, these indices are just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, it's equal to 1, then you're correct. There's no determinant of epsilon. If I defined it in the way I just defined it for you, where it's this way here, then it already includes the determinant epsilon in the, in the definition. So it's just notation. OK, so um, plus for me. So constructing this action, I mean, they just worked hard, and uh, they were able to show it to supersymmetry. So let me tell you what the supersymmetry transformation supersymmetric transformation of G, it's more convenient to write the supersymmetric transformation of this bare bond. When it has a flat index, you can treat it just as an ordinary Pauli matrix in flat space. But when it has a curved index, m, you need to define it using the Vier line. also, in fact, another term which couples to the spin here. But it's at that time. Any other questions? 
OK, so this is, I didn't tell you how the fermion transform. So as you see, the bosons always transform to the fermions without derivatives, as in all the other cases of supersymmetry. And the fermion is going to have to transform into the bosons, but with derivatives. So the transformation is delta psi and alpha. Del alpha. Tell you what this means in a second. So these formulas are not precise. They're coefficients, blah blah blah. But um, <laughs> the idea is that the gravitino transforms into the three form, or places the field strength of the three form, but it also transforms into the derivative of the supersymmetry grant. So what this means is that this theory is actually not only invariant under supersymmetries where C is constant, those are called global supersymmetries. It's invariant under supersymmetries where C is uh, uh, a local value, value, a local parameter. So C can depend on X. Now the reason why that happens is because, of course, this theory is not just invariant under translation. It's invariant under weak parameterizations, which are just a, just a way of saying it's a local transformation. <coughs> so of course, that implies that it also has to be invariant not just under constant supersymmetry, but under local supersymmetry. And in fact, that means you have a gauge field associated with the local supersymmetry, just like the metric is the gauge field associated with the local translation. Gauge field associated with the local supersymmetry is precisely the gravitino. So this gravitino has a gauge symmetry. Okay, now um, how it transforms, it transforms as the covariant derivative of C, which again is going to involve the Christoffel connection. So it's Tm. But there's another term which is Christoffel connection, or more precisely the spin connection. I'm not going to try to define all these objects, but um, this connection here, which is closely related to the, uh, it's related to the Christoffel connection, involves derivatives of the metric. W is constructed from derivatives, and more precisely, derivatives of the Beerbach. So as expected. The transformation of the fermion involves derivatives of the bosons, either through F or through the spin connection. Okay, so, so these are the supersymmetry transformations, and they preserve this, well, they preserve the action when for any function C. Okay, so it's locally supersymmetric. dimensions. I haven't compactified anything. So supergravity in any dimension turns out to be invariant not just under global supersymmetries, but under local supersymmetry. So Carmen already mentioned this in two dimensions. Um, so it's a gate, supersymmetry is a gauge symmetry, not just a global symmetry. Yes, Don't you have the spin connection in the Yes, yes, so I mentioned that, but I didn't write it. So there's another term which is omega m theta alpha something n. So you need these connections in order for the covariant derivative to transform covariantly, that's why it's called covariant derivative, under <coughs> rotations of these flat space indices. Any questions? Okay, so this is 11 dimension. And the last thing we're going to do is dimensionally reduce this not to 4 dimensions, but to 10 dimensions. So just on a circle. And that's going to be relevant, obviously, for a string theory. Okay, so we're not going to break any of the supersymmetries. We're going to keep 32 supersymmetries. 
but we're going to reduce the dimension from 11 to 10. Okay, so we're still only at 128 bosons, 128 fermions. But now we're going to construct the supergravity theory in 10 dimensions. OK, so let's just remember how a spinner will transform. So if you have a spinner in um, eleven dimensions, called A. Oh, sorry, I'm using A many times. So let's say A is a, a spinner index one to thirty. This will split into a chiral and antichiral ten-dimensional spinner index. Remember that when you're in odd dimension, you have five. So in 11 dimensions, you have five plus or minuses. That's why you have 32 components, two to the fifth. And when you decompose to 10 dimensions, this will split into chiral and antichiral. So the chiral will be the ones with an even number of pluses. So for example, plus, 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 minus, like I said. And the antichiral will be the ones with an odd number of pluses. So for example, plus, 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 plus. So there's 16 of these and 16 of these. So this would be Majorana vial, this would be Majorana antivial. So let me call these alpha and alpha bar. So this is chiral. This is empty. I guess I can put a bar on this. So this is how a spinner will decompose. So now we can figure out how these fields here decompose. Okay, any questions about what we're doing? Sorry, could you show the equation of motion of those fields? Yes. Okay, so at least to linearized level. So the equation of motion for the gravitational field to linearized level is just Rmn equals every Gmnr, and then there's a, a term with Tmn, stress tensor. That's the kind of question you're asking. For the, for the AMNP equation of motion to linearize level, it's just the, the derivative of the field strength equals zero. So this just comes by varying AM in this action. And finally, the equation of motion for the gravitino is sigma MNP del P. Now, what, what do you emphasize of the relative Ah, because I did, there are lots of interactions. So the, 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 the Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm saying linearized just because otherwise I would have to spend 15 minutes and <laughs> I would get it wrong anyway. So, so this is just the, the, if you want to understand the physical states, this is enough. But of course, if you want to understand the interactions, this is not enough. So this linearized level has all the gauge symmetry, so you can figure out what the physical states are. But um, yeah, you need the full covariant action. OK, any other question? OK, so this theory here is going to have one chiral supersymmetry and one antichiral supersymmetry. The language that people use is, it has two supersymmetries in 10 dimensions. So you could just write n equals 2, d equals 10. Right? Because it's twice the minimum. But the way people write it is to distinguish it from another one, which I'll discuss later. It's written n equals 1, comma 1. Because it's one chiral and one antichiral. There are the choices. Sorry? There are the choices. When I compactify, to 10 dimensions, this is what I get. I don't know what choice you're saying. But oh, no, the n equal to. There'll be another supergravity in 10 dimensions that does not come from that. No I'll discuss that later. OK, so this is called n equals 1, 1. Another way to describe it is called type 2a. OK, the other one will be called type 2b. That's why it's called type 2 OK, so what are the fields of type 2a? OK, 
Okay, so GMN. Well, it can split into, so let's say small n and small n now go from just 0 to 9. And alpha and alpha bar go from 1 to 16. So GMN, capital MN, splits up into ordinary GMN. It could have one of the components being in the 10 direction. Or it could have both of the components being in the 10 direction. Okay, so you have three times with fields. Three times. Whereas in Yang Mills, you only got two. You got spin one and scale. So this is, of course, the metric in 10 dimensions. This is going to be identified with the one form in 10 dimensions, which will be, so this is a, this is a a U1 gauge field. And this is a scalar, which I'll call phi. Now, A, M, and P, you can do a similar decomposition. It decomposes into a three form when all the indices go from 0 to 9. Or you can go to a two form where one of the components is 10. Because it's anti symmetric, only one of the components can be 10. So this will be called BMN. It's a two form. Okay, this psi and alpha also decomposes. So it decomposes into, um, first of all, this alpha, um, just so I don't confuse. This decomposes into psi m alpha or psi m alpha bar. So this r could be either um, an alpha or an alpha bar. So this goes from 1 to 32, this goes from 1 to 16. Or this index could be psi 10. So this we'll call chi alpha, and this will be chi. So this is spin one half, or this is spin three half. So these are the fields of type 2A supergravity. So of course we still have 128 bosons and 128 fermions, it's just they're distributed in a different way. And Barton already did the massless spectrum, is that right? Not yet. Yes? Okay. For the closed stream. Yeah. Yes? Good. Okay, thank you. So what's the massless spectrum of the closed string in 10 dimensions? Well, you have a GMN, you have a BMN, and you have a scalar. So these are the same fields as in bosonic string theory in the massless set. But there are other fields which are not in the bosonic string theory in the massless set. This field, And of course, the fermions are not in the boson. Okay, so there are extra bosonic fields in the superstring that are not in the bosonic string. And these fields, as you'll see in, in Carmen's lectures, come from what's called the Ramon Ramon sector. So I think this lecture, she will, today she will already tell you what the Ramon sector is. And if you do the closed string, you have a left Ramon sector and a right Ramon sector. And these are these. So the Lagrangian you get for these fields is, of course, very similar to what we had before. And now it's in 10 dimensions. So the B field, is, you can construct a field strength out of it, which is usually labeled as H. H and of course you can also construct field strengths out of this three form in one form and 
after a suitable field redefinition, what you're calling the fields, you can show that these three fields here from the boson extreme appear in precisely the same way as they do in boson extreme. So that you'll probably see today, right? This type of effective action? Maybe. So the dilaton always appears in front of these fields with a vector e to the minus 2 phi. And it turns out that e to the phi, the expectation value, is associated with the coupling constant. Sometimes called g squared. So this factor here essentially tells you how, how the string couples to itself. Now it turns out these other fields, either from the Ramon sector or from the Ramon-Ramon sector, don't couple in the same way. In fact, they couple couple without a factor of e to the minus 2 phi. That in fact follows from supersymmetry, but I don't have time to show it to you. So the coupling to ramon ramon field is slightly non-conventional. Of course, here the definition is fmn is Okay, and of course there's also fermion. You get couplings of the gravitino and also of the dilatino. So these supersymmetry transformations are not going to be modified. This essentially stays the same, but now you have another field which is the dilaton. So the dilaton is going to have the following type of transformation. It's going to transform into the dilatino. This dilatino here. Okay, so the fields are different, the names of the fields are different, but of course you still have 128 plus 128. And you can of course compute the supersymmetry transformations by starting in 11 and then just dimensionally reducing these. You don't have to re-derive the supersymmetry transformations because they're exactly the same. Any questions? So why do you get the dimensional similarities? Why is what? You no? said that uh, the dimensional comes from a particular thing. Yeah. 11 dimensional. So the string propagates in 10 dimensions. So naively, it has no relation to 11 dimensional supergravity. But when you try to describe the string theory non perturbatively, as we'll see next week, 11 dimensional supergravity plays a role. I can tell you in words why it's, why it's reasonable. We, we said that phi is the string coupling constant. Okay. But, but phi came, remember, from dimensional reduction of just one of the components of the metric. So if you consider 11-dimensional supergravity, really, you're considering all kinds of values for phi. And that's why it's some non-perturbative version of string theory. Can't say more. Okay, but this is, of course, related to perturbative string theory, because uh, this is in 10 dimensions. So this is just what you get if you compute a string pre-amplitude, and you take the low energy limit. You'll get precisely this type of edge. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is type 2b. I'll do this quickly. Unfortunately, it's easy to do once you've done type 2a. And the trick is to write these Ramon Ramon. So the only difference between type 2a and type 2b in the super string, as Carmen will discuss, is that you flip the chirality of one of the gravitinos. So here you have two gravitinos which have opposite chirality. This is type 2a. There's another theory called type 2b, which has the same fields as in the bosonic string, but the Ramon Ramon field and the fermions are different. The difference is that instead of having two gravitinos and two dilatinos of opposite chirality, these now have the same chirality. So you have psi m alpha, and we can call it psi tilde m alpha. They're two different ones. And similarly, you have chi alpha, actually, yeah. chi tilde. 
So actually, the um, if I'm using the same notation, this would actually be chi alpha bar. These have the opposite chirality from the sides, but they have the same chirality as the other. So these are the fermions of type 2b, and the Ramon Ramon field will also switch. So this is type 2a. Type 2b you cannot get from dimensional reduction. Because it's a chiral theory, it's n equals 2, 0. It has two chiral supersymmetries and zero antichiral supersymmetries. So instead of having q alpha and q alpha bar, they have two supersymmetries of the same chiral. So they're both Majorana bar. <coughs> so they'll call them q alpha and q tilde alpha. This can't be obtained from compactification just because compactification always produces a non chiral theory. Non chiral means that if you do a parity transformation, you get the same theory back. Whereas type 2b, if you do a parity transformation, it will change from n equals 2, 0 to n equals 0, 2. So this is called a chiral theory. Now, with this knowledge and one more piece of information, you can guess the type 2b. So the new piece of information is that these Ramon Ramon fields can be understood as coming from the left right product of two Ramon fields. So a Ramon field, as you'll learn probably today, is a spinner. It's a fermionic object, it's a space time spinner, which has obviously a spinner in there. Now, if you have two Ramon fields, then obviously you have two spinner units. So one of them came from the left moving sector, the other from the right moving sector. And any product of two spinners can be decomposed in terms of these forms. And the decomposition, of course, depends on the dimension. But it turns out in 10 dimensions, if you have a chiral spinner and an anti-chiral spinner, it decomposes into a zero form, which we call F. It's called zero delta alpha beta bar. Remember that there's a, there's a way to contract two spinners of opposite chirality. And then you have a two form, which has two spinners, times sigma mn, alpha beta bar. And then finally you have a four form. Now it turns out that a zero form, because it's a field strength, these field strengths, of course, have to satisfy Bianchi identity. A zero form field strength satisfies Bianchi identity has to vanish. Bianchi identity says that the derivative of it is zero, so it has to be constant. More precisely, it has to be constant. These fields here are precisely these fields here. And in fact, you can write this in a more Compact notation is F alpha beta bar, F gamma delta bar, sigma m alpha gamma, sigma m beta bar. So I can write this directly in terms of these phi spinners. This is equal to the term we have. So that's another way to write the Lagrangian of type 2a. And now we're ready to do type 2b. The only difference in type 2b is that f is spinners of the same chirality. For obvious reasons, the supersymmetries have the same chirality. So the Ramon states will also have the same chirality. Now in 10 dimensions, if you have spinners of the same chirality, instead of getting a zero form, two form, and four form, you get a one form. Form. And the five form. The five form turns out to be self tool. So 
what this means is that the type 2B theory, instead of having a one-form gauge field and a three-form gauge field, which leads to a two-form and four-form field string, it has an extra scalar, which is the one-form field string. It has an extra two-form, which, which is the three-form field string, and a four-form, or more precisely, a self to a four-form. This field string gives a self to a four-form. And the Lagrangian is just the same as before. It's just now we have, instead of indices of the same chirality, a different chirality, we now have indices of the same chirality. So that's the Lagrangian for type 2b, up to a subtlety. The subtlety is that this is a self-dual 5 form. And um, if you write down this action for self-dual 5 form, um, you won't get the right equations of motion. So you have to impose in addition that this is self-dual. OK, so that's essentially um, what I wanted to say about type 2b. So this is a different string theory, type 2b. But of course, it's closely related to type 2b. So those are the ones you'll get that the Carmen will be discussing. OK, so I'll stop there. it always flips the chirality. So, so these two, after they have opposite chirality, if they came from this 11 dimensions. You could also, of course, get it from the supersymmetry transformations. You see that this pi, so I could have written this this way. This has an up index, this has a rate index because it's compared to the sigma matrix. This one has to the opposite. Where are where if alpha bar appears in the action? Where this one? Yes. It appears here. Okay. Oh, just a quadratic. Can you go in a little about the other is for now is that impossible to take that? These are the only two. These, there's only two, what's well, up? This, these are the only two with 32 supersymmetries, which is n equals 1, 1, or n equals 2, 0. There's another supergravity theory which only has one supersymmetry, which may be n equals 1, 0. In that case, you only have one gravitino. So you just get rid of one of the gravitinos, also one of the dilatinos. The bosonic fields are the same as in the bosonic string. But it doesn't have any Ramon Ramon fields, this is by common So it's just the, the bosonic string action essentially plus some fermion. So that's the that's what you get if you do heterotics. So what is the problem in order to couple the high form of the Ramon Ramon field uh, with the RNS? With the what? With a super string uh, from so before. there's no problem in coupling. The problem is in writing down an action. So the problem is that when you have a self-dual field, you have the equation dm fmn pqrs equals zero. So that's that's the equation of motion. But that's not enough. You also have the equation that fmn pqr is equal to epsilon m n p q r s p w f s p d So this is the requirement that it's self-dual. Now this one, 
you get immediately from this action by varying the gauge field. But this one you have to put in by hand. There's no simple way to get this from an action field. So that's not only true in 10 dimensions for cell 205 form, it's true, for example, in two dimensions if you want to describe a chiral boson, it's also it's the same problem. 